Welcome to the Present History Podcast, and we have a really exciting episode for you today, as I had the opportunity to sit down with Hannah Gregg, an 18th century historian and a TV and film historical consultant that has worked on the likes of Poldark, Bridgerton, and The Favourite, and has a wildly successful podcast of her own called The Historical Film Club with Alex von Tunzelman. Um, it was a real pleasure to sit down with Hannah and I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. So get comfortable and enjoy my interview with Hannah Gregg. Well, Hannah, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast uh, today. It's a real pleasure and an honour to to have you here. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. No. So uh, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself, uh, your background? What made you get into, into history? Oh, just all the questions at once. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, let's start with what, why did I get into history? Um, I, I think... Probably like most historians, partly by accident. I never saw it as a career, you know, when I was at school, it wasn't sort of a plan. Um, I, you know, remember actually mostly planning to become a medical doctor when I was a child growing up, but I uh, decided I didn't want to spend that many years at university. I loved history and so just thought, well, I'll do history at university and then go and get a job after that. And then that never quite happened and I just carried on doing more history uh, so a master's and a PhD and and so on and um, so it was never plans but as a child I loved the stories that come with history I I always you know loved storytelling and and literature as well and um, and I used to go you know like most children go on museums and historic sites and I used to be fascinated by thinking about all the people who'd been in those places before me so you know when you go around those kind of ruined castles and there's some dip in the steps or some of mark in the wall around yeah. an old staircase I used to think how many people must have walked on those steps to actually dip the stone and who were they and what were they like and mm. what were their lives like and were they like me or and um and I was always interested in that and I think that just stayed with me and then for want of a better set of choices I just um pursued that interest <laughs> and didn't oh, stop that's awesome <laughs> Yeah, no, that's fantastic. That is, that's the reason I love history as well is is those stories and because history is just a collection of of the stories of every person and event that's that's ever lived. So, no, I love that. It's a, and going off from that, what drew you into TV and film consultancy, kind of alongside the the academic group? Well, that happens really by accident. So, I'm a specialist in kind of 18th and early 19th century British history. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did my PhD on and uh, what I started to work on as an academic um, within universities. Um, and I was just approached um, quite early on in my academic career to consult on a film called The Duchess, which was set mm -hmm. in late 18th century England. And I think they'd been asking around historians for someone who could um, consult. And for whatever reason, my name had ended up being passed to them. And perhaps I was the only historian who enthusiastically said, yes, that sounds yeah. fun. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, so, yeah, sort of, you know, just by chance, I didn't know what I was getting into at all. But I found mm. myself working with this wonderful film. And I learned so much about filmmaking through that experience. I think I was probably not a great consultant, I have to say, because right. I was just so like <laughs> enjoying, you know, the kind of atmosphere of being on a set. And I loved all the kit and all the cameras and all the jobs that everyone had. You know, yeah. I was fascinated that there was one person's job was responsible for like moving one bit of the camera, you know, and that was it. Wow. <laughs> that was all they did or wow. changing the batteries. And I loved all of that. And um, so I learned a lot about filmmaking and was interested in it. And then I think because of that early experience, you know, when sort of opportunities came into my peripheral vision, I always went for them. And so I ended up working for quite a few BBC dramas for a while, um, including Poldark. Um, and I always found it a really interesting and positive experience, um, particularly writing, working with writers and directors, you know, the people who are trying to construct and visualise 
these worlds that are inspired by the past, uh, but not necessarily trying to take every aspect of history, but thinking about what aspects of history we want to use for storytelling and, and why and who the audiences are. And I, I liked all those conversations. So I always just um, continue to do that alongside, uh, you know, my kind of traditional academic work of teaching and, and writing and researching. And um, yes, it's just happened that it's continued. So I've been very yeah. fortunate, really, to continue to have those experiences. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And, and recently, you've been working on, on Bridgerton and Sanderton. Yes, um, what, that's right. What's that like? Yeah, the most recent ones and the favourite I did a few years ago as well. Yes. And um, there's another drama that's coming out at some point. <laughs> um, <but> it's not <laughs> That one's top those. secret. <laughs> another drama that's called just another drama. <laughs> um, and and Bridgerton as well. And yeah, and I often find that I, I've had something different from each of them. And um, mm. um, so obviously Bridgerton was, you know, very big Netflix production, um, yeah. kind of produced, you know, from America as well. And, um, you know, that was the first time I'd worked on a production for a streaming platform, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's designed to hit a very large international audience very quickly. Sure. Um, it's quite a different kind of energy in terms of the expectations of an audience compared to something that might roll out first on the BBC and then get picked up across different territories more slowly. Um, so, yeah, I, I've always found something new from working with each of them. Of course, every project is different. And, um, you know, we send sometimes group period dramas together and think they're one kind of thing or one kind of story. Yeah. And that's really not the case. And even if you start to think about it in the smallest bit of detail, of course, they are all actually quite different from each other. And they have mm. different purposes and, and different expectations and and different aesthetics and um and so there's always something new intellectually i think to be to be working with as a historian absolutely no it's it's a fascinating world to me but like you mentioned um your academic work uh, you wrote a book called uh, the beau monde which is all about the role of fashion in the status of hierarchy uh, in georgian uh, london which i personally found fascinating and um fashion has always been a powerful agent in uh, culture creation and in denoting social status and, and hierarchy and it's safe to say that that was rather impressively shown in 18th century Britain uh, mm. could you tell us a little bit more about uh, that and your research and your work in that yeah I think um and I've, I'm always interested in constructions of power really historically mm. and why certain groups of people retain authority and, and others don't and how hierarchies are kind of manifested through history. And although my writing was mostly on the kind of world of an elite and their constructions of power, I think as a student and a PhD student, I was really interested in the kind of 1960s social histories that were written mm. by people like E.P. Thompson, which is all about the performances of of culture, about gestures of power, about systems of exclusion and inclusion. And so my work on 18th century fashionable society was really exploring those things. And it was interested in the relationship between who had political power and who had all the money and also this new idea of what it meant to be fashionable in the 18th century yeah. and how those things intersected with each other. So that was kind of what I was interested in. And I think that um, it reflects a kind of interest in performative aspects of history, which, of course, work very visually on screen. Um, yeah. You know how people express themselves through gestures and through their, through their possessions, through props, through costume, um, yeah. and those things translate very well to a kind of you know a world of visual media. Um, but these themes actually they they're the focus of a new exhibition that's opening at Kensington Palace later this year with some friends who've been involved who curators at Historic World Palaces, and they are looking specifically at the kind of relationship between the 18th century royal court and the red carpet and they've got amazing things from wow. the modern red carpet and they're putting them alongside 18th century fashion it's going to be wow. great <laughs> so yeah. that's um yeah there's other people that are interested in these kind of things too it's going to be fun yeah no that sounds fascinating and for me what fascinates me about history in general is that intersection between the past and the present and and how we can see a lot of the same trends happening today so that that's fascinating kind of looking at um, fashion in the Georgian period and, and how that worked within hierarchy and power and status 
and how it still works today with our celebrity culture and, and all that kind yeah. of stuff. It's fascinating. It is, it is about manifestations of celebrity and influencers mm. and stylists and kind of product placements, like all the things that we're familiar with from a modern visual world. We, we can find, you know, in the 18th century as well as this kind of world of a fashionable moment. But yeah. um, I mean, the relationship between past and present is always something that comes up, isn't it, when people engage with period dramas and and sometimes people be quite critical of the suggestion that there's a sort of modern moment in a drama or a modern character or something that suggests them outside their own time. Mm. But but I always find that juxtaposition between our own world and the things we're familiar with and things from the past actually also helps to see the past as different because we can see the gaps and the, the, the distances and, and the changes as well. And as yeah. historians, we are fundamentally interested in narratives of change, of things, how things change over time. And those and those distances are made apparent in period dramas or in exhibitions or other places by juxtaposing old and new, modern and modern and traditional in those absolutely. ways. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well with, with Bridgerton using kind of the more modern songs and making them into kind of more orchestrated classical versions of those songs. To me, it really hit a chord because while they wouldn't have been singing Taylor Swift uh, during Georgian period, um, it did hit what it would have felt like to be in those rooms or to the emotions of the music. So I'd be fascinated to hear your, your thoughts on the use of the music there as well. Yeah, that's I mean, that's absolutely true. And, the, and sort of the point of using those those modern moments is that, um, you know, we're trying to often the drama is trying to capture the emotional experience of what it was like at the time and and of course to us classical music feels very traditional and old and sort of quite ex you know exclusive but for the people of the early 19th century the real bon ton the real beaumont that we see in bridgerton they, they regarded themselves as ultra modern they were at the cutting edge of fashion they regarded themselves as the most kind of democratic and interesting and cosmopolitan and exciting society with new music new art new kinds of of sculpture and innovation and creativity mm. they didn't regard themselves as as stuck in the past or yeah. <laughs> or kind of a world of a national trust kind of you know preservation yeah. they felt themselves to be ultra modern and so you need those moments of our own modernity within kinds of drama storytelling to help us capture that experience, to give us mm. that moment of like, okay, so actually this was like the pop music of the time, or this was like the most radical kind of club or whatever. And, and it helps us give those things that are familiar to us to help us understand the emotions that we're meant to be experiencing as whatever character is going through, is going through their story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's striking that balance between authenticity and accuracy. And it's something that something like Peaky Blinders uh, did really well, like using the Arctic monkeys to to build the, the energy or the, the feeling of, of the moment as well. So it's fascinating. But kind of taking your academic work and your research into this world of TV and, and drama, what's the process usually like? What does that look like for, for consulting on a TV show or film? Um, well, it varies from, you know, production to production. So part of the skill is actually finding out what is most useful mm. at whatever moment you're joining this, you know, kind of, you know, journey to, to filming. And as I've worked for longer with the industry, I now tend to work earlier in the creative process. So quite often I see stories that are in development that haven't wow. yet been scripted, that they're trying to think about the kind of structure of a storyline. And that's often the best place to get involved, really, because that's mm. when you can bed in the historical information that's most useful or help it be shaped or inspired by particular kind of historical people or events or moments. Um, and so, you know, really, I see my role as trying to allow the production to access as high quality historical information as quickly as possible. Sure. Um, either directly from my own research or by putting them in touch with people who are particular experts in particular areas so that that information can help inform the choices that they're making about the story that they want to tell. And, you know, quite often we are dealing with fictional worlds. So there's a lot of space for stories to move however they mm. choose, however the writer or, or the producers or the director to wish to take that story. But the, it tends to be most useful if you can root it in historical examples wherever possible, because then you know the choices that you're making are are realistic for the people at the time, uh, are 
are kind of rooted in information that we have that we can marshal mm -hmm. to help us choose kind of how we're going to write that that story um but at the same time then it's also useful to know when you're completely deviating from that and saying well mm -hmm. actually that is there's no basis for that at all so we're just going you know totally freestyle yeah. <laughs> in that moment <laughs> and and it's about having the information to be able to understand those mm. choices so you know you're not just doing it you just don't just create a story from nothing and then and then add the history in later that doesn't tend to happen that often actually um it is about using the history to help you navigate the kind of story that you want to tell right right and so, and so would you be quite involved in the actual script writing process and, and kind of mapping out the story as well depends on the production for some of them yes okay for others oh, they cool. have other people for that <laughs> it just yeah. depends on um <laughs> it's interesting that every production does work differently and um i mean some productions like bridgerton have a writer's room as well as mm. a lead writer and you know a showrunner you know there's a big group of people involved in the storytelling and um I'm always very sensitive to that because of course it's not my story it's not I, it's not my script it's not my book that I've written it's it's a world that's being created by people who are incredibly skilled and experienced mm. at what they do and um so I always see my job is to try and support that process as sure. as productively as possible um and so yeah I don't I don't really I very rarely sort of throw my hands up and say that would never happen it's usually like well let's see if we can make it happen in this way and then i'll you know sleep sure. better at night or something yeah. <laughs> so. oh, no that's good and and kind of on that how do you go about choosing what's okay to compromise on because obviously you're, you're trying to blend fact and fiction and it, it is a drama so there's going to be dramatic elements um so how do you go about deciding which parts you're, you're happy to, to kind of compromise on well there's very there's very rarely one person who makes that decision. And sure. um, and I think, you know, as the historian working with a production, it's sort of not your decision to make. You can make a case for something. Mm -hmm. And I can say very clearly, well, actually, this is pretty far from what I would expect to be happening at the time. Here are some other options. Would you like one of these? And if they say no, then that is totally, absolutely their artistic choice and their their free their free choice to make and there can be so many factors involved in those kind of decision makings that's not just to do with history so one is about how can we have as much historical information as possible but another is can we actually make that meaningful on screen does that actually work for the character right. and what we want them to do like sometimes you can only you know you've got maybe 30 seconds of screen time for there to be something happening to somebody that moves the story on and so it's not always that helpful to have a really complicated political election scene or something in that yeah. moment because <laughs> it's going to distract the viewer from what the story actually is so mm. i mean part of the work i think of a consultant is to try and find the most useful scenarios and solutions for the story that's being told and so you know it's all very well and good me saying something like oh well women would never have accessed this in that way or or they would have done this or or not i need to think well what's the most useful set of actions for that character and how can we make that as right. rooted in history as possible unless you're trying to tell a very particular historical story which of mm. course then then you're trying to to figure out how to take all of that massive historical information and tell it in an as exciting way but as, you know as close to the the historical record as possible and that's a kind of different sort of set of procedures really um but then you know what do i do in terms of i always sometimes think is there anything that i've sort of thought oh, i could never never you know i can't accept that and i'm yeah. going to get really frustrated and walk off that's never <laughs> that's never happened i think some people have done that that's not me i've never yet left a production <laughs> in a kind of massive history huff yeah. um but i mean i think you know sometimes there's always moments where you felt like i don't really don't know how this is going to to turn out and of course the favorite was one of those um mm. productions because when i saw the script and started talking to the director um for that they were quite far into the production process but still about right. five or six years before it was out on screen wow. but kind of 20 years into production so it was oh, a very slow wow. process so i was the latecomer yeah. comparatively but again you know then the, the director hadn't yet made an english language film um, we wow. didn't, I didn't, there was no talk of this amazing cast who then became attached to it. You know, the script is very different from anything I'd ever read before. And I thought, well, this is going to be, I've got no idea how this is going to come out, but I was really interested in working on the project because it seemed so different. And I wanted to do something that was, that was different from what I'd been yeah. doing previously. 
And so I did sort of have a conversation to myself and, and think, well, what's the line for this? What would I not be happy with? And and I thought the most fundamental thing for me for that story is that the women had power, that they were that there was not a question about whether or not they're politically powerful. Mm. And I felt confident that that is what the script and the director wanted to do. He was interested in these women at court and how powerful they were. And there wasn't any effort to explain that or justify it. We were just asked to accept it in the right. story. And so I found that really interesting. Mm. But that was the sort of line for me was I don't want these women to be, you know, without authority, without power. I want to make sure, you know, and that and that, that came through. So um, I suppose I do have those thoughts sometimes, but um, but I've never had a production where I've actually, yeah, been pushed pushed away, <laughs> pushed off. But yeah. then I think that's you know because the productions that tend to reach out to historians are the ones who actually want to have the conversations. Yeah. Um, so you know, it's usually it's usually a happy experience. It has been for me yeah. anyway. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by BCAD Clothing. Most of the time, history-themed hoodies and t-shirts are childish, in-your-face, cheesy, and most of the time, frankly, unwearable. But at BCAD Clothing, they create subversive, stylish, and subtle history-themed clothing that you can wear and not feel embarrassed. They also use 100% sustainable, environmentally friendly, and organic cotton so that it's good for the planet and feels great to wear it too. The quality is insane. If you want to check out the full range, head to presenthistory.co.uk, press shop in the menu and check it out. That's good. That's good. I'm glad to hear it. And kind of along those lines uh, with The Favourite and, and Women in Power, what kind of role do you see for TV shows and films in kind of changing some of our preconceived historical narratives that are just widely accepted um how how big of a role do you see them playing well i think they can be very very powerful and useful i think that um i mean often when you start to look at period dramas through a kind of academic lens you know if you start mm. to take a bit of kind of critical approach to them is that most dramas have multiple stories within them right um, you know, as we would have in society today. And some characters are designed to show a kind of ongoing world of tradition. Others are taking a different kind of path. And then there's sometimes other stories as well that are that are associated in there that sometimes we miss or sometimes we don't notice so much. And and it's very easy to presume that period drama is somehow backward looking or not keeping up with with you know kind of latest trends in academic work or whatever but you know call the midwife is one of the most kind of radical yeah. <laughs> um, tv dramas around that shows you so many different kind of aspects of history in the past and uses it incredibly cleverly um yeah. But yet sometimes newspapers still write about period dramas as though they're a kind of cosy nostalgia. They don't mm. always make us feel that comfortable. Sometimes they make us feel quite uncom uncomfortable because they're asking questions of the past or asking us whether or not particular people um, had particular kind of experiences or not that can actually make us feel quite uncomf uncomfortable. Yeah. So they're not always this kind of journey into nostalgia. Mm. Um, and I think historical fiction can be really useful because it can force you to ask the questions what if, or why not, or how true is this? Yeah. And actually by asking that question, we can sometimes say, well, we don't know how true that is or not because nobody has yet done enough research or asked the questions mm. in those ways. And so sometimes historical fiction can force us ahead in terms of some of the questions and approaches that we're asking of history itself. And um, I find that, that interesting. And I think I... I was sort of somehow surprised to learn that when I was working, started working mm. with the creative industry, I sort of thought that historical fiction might be 20 years behind sure. academia, but actually that's not the case. I think fiction, by looking for the gaps, asks sometimes questions of us, of historians, and we mm. realise we don't have the answers and that there needs to be more research to find them. Yeah, no, that's really good. And it, it can kind of act as a catalyst in that yeah. sense for, for more research. No, that's, yeah. that's really good. So in your, in your career of consulting on TV and film, have you found any sort of bugbears or anything that kind of just frustrates you about the process at all? Um, no, not 
not me. Really, I think okay. if I did, I'd struggle to, yeah. to work in the industry. <laughs> yeah. Not not so much. Uh, bug bears. Um, well, I think if I was to just to try and you know be forcibly grumpy occasionally. I mean, there's you know certain <laughs> stereotypes which manifest, which are kind of important, and they, they manifest on screen, but they don't always really work for historians. So one is that you know working class people don't have any colourful clothes. Right. Like, you know, that we of, we often have a kind of visual aesthetic where rich people are very colourful and less well-off people are just in, you know, scruffy, dirty clothes. Yeah. Um, that Historically, that doesn't always <laughs> carry <laughs> true. For my period of history, the 18th century, domestic maids are kind of fascinating leaders of fashion. They purchase small accessories and ribbons. There's a mm. whole access of a whole range of people to new kinds of fabrics that have incredibly vibrant kind of effects on the palette, you know, people's visual palettes, the fashion palettes in yeah. the 18th century. We don't really see that on screen for everybody across the social scale because mm. visually sometimes you need to know who's your main character right. <laughs> and you don't want to be yeah. distracted by this amazing looking person in the background <laughs> of the market. Like, wow, look at their amazing dress. Um, uh, so you can see why. But yeah, if you used to be really grumpy story, that'd be one thing. The other thing that does sometimes irritate me, and I will sometimes say on set, and I'm sure I've said this quite a few times before, <laughs> is that sometimes there's a tendency for everybody to walk really slowly on period dramas, as if oh. they're ambling along very slowly in London streets, as if there's nowhere for anybody to get to. And that does annoy me a bit <laughs> because, <laughs> because walking is one of the main modes of transport. You know, yeah. we've got places to go. Like, yeah. you haven't got 100 years to get there. <laughs> like, people might have an urgency about where they need to be. They might be running late. <laughs> yeah. you know? So, so um, yeah, sometimes I do. Sometimes I say, can we please speed up a bit? Because the walking pace is driving me mad. <laughs> like, yeah. that's, but you know that that's maybe just that I'm naturally quite a fast walker, so right, it could okay, be yeah. as much could be as much me as my interest in history, and I'm just disguising it as a historical <laughs> point. But yeah, yeah, slow walking and not enough colourful clothes for poorer people is probably the two things if I have yeah. to. But you know, ah, no, that's that's brilliant. <laughs> that's brilliant. So as as kind of a final question to to wrap up, um, what is one thing that you would say that you've learnt? over your career as a historian and as a consultant that you'd want to let your younger self know that might help them out a bit in the process? Um, I think that there's there's nothing wrong with being interested in the story. Mm. That, um, that's, that stories are what inspire, inspire us and carry us. And, um, and it's fine to try and find the story in things. So, you know, I think sometimes within history, in the way that we're trained, you know, as historians, it's all about kind of critical analysis and thinking about the data and finding the evidence, all of which is absolutely essential. But within that, it's really important to think about the story. Why Why are you studying this event? Who are the people that you're interested in in mm. this event and why? Why do you want to write this history? What You know, what's the, the purpose of sharing this information? And so I think, yeah, don't worry about the story the interest in the story like it's mm. fine stories are good and that's fine yeah no nah, that's awesome i love that i love that well if, hannah thank you so much for for your time thank you for coming on the podcast it's been a real pleasure to to chat to you today so thank you thank you very much for having me thank you very much for listening to this episode of the present history podcast. If you want to find out more about Hannah Gregg, her work, research and her podcast, you can find all the links in the description below and in the show notes if you're listening on audio. Make sure to to check her out and go watch the films as well. They are fantastic films, fantastic TV shows, so go and check those out. Thank you again for tuning in to the Present History podcast and we'll see you in the next one.